it's Sammy for another episode of the I Do Music Podcast. And our goal and our mission is to empower and educate musicians and artists worldwide. And on today's episode, we sat down with artist and actor Lil Zane discussing how he started doing talent shows as early as 10 years old, working with legends like Tupac and even opening for Biggie and continuing to make music, which he's set to release this year. Hey, it's Sammy for another episode of the I Do Music Podcast, and I'm sitting down with artist and actor and all of the things, Lil Zane. What's good? What's good? What's good? How you feeling? I'm good. How you doing? Good. Talking about we only going to talk for a couple of minutes. Man. He don't feel like his life is is that uh, interesting to be talking for 45 minutes, but little does he know we're going to be here for a little bit. Okay. <laughs> I'm excited What's to have up? you. Thank um, you. So, I mean, obviously people know you as artists. They might have seen you on some movies. Um, You just said that you were in the studio late last night, so that means you're still out here working, putting out... Are you putting out your own music? I'm doing a little bit of everything. I'm trying to put out my own music, um, writing for other people, too. Nice. Yeah. Can you talk about who you are writing with or working with? No. I can't talk about it. can't talk about it? Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I just like to get the exclusives. So, let's start. So, you are born in New York, raised pretty much... Here in Atlanta, though. Yes, ma'am. This is home. Yeah. Okay, so I want to know, I mean, we know that, like, this soil, something in, in the soil here, the atmosphere, maybe the water, that gets the creative juices flowing early on. But for mm-hmm. you, um, you were inspired as early as age 10 by the likes of Criss Cross, uh, Another Bad Creation, yeah. and so on and so forth. But how did you find your, discover that love for music? Was it family? Was it... Um, just grew up on um, my mom playing music around the house and stuff like that. And um, what you know, was she just, playing? Um, she used to play like Frankie Beverly and Mays and um, Whitney Houston, and she used to play um, Bobby Brown, Michael Jackson, um, Rick James, just a lot of people like that. Mm-hmm. And um, the classics. Just, yeah, it just made me want to do music. And then um, growing up in Atlanta too, um, you had people like um, like you said, TLC and Criss Cross and people that was kind of like a little older than me, but still they was teenagers. So it gave me kind of like a hope that I could do it too. Yeah. Yeah. As early as 10, that was like, that's like a very uh, distinct age of of wanting to pursue something specifically like that. Did you like play any instruments or was it just like mainly you started rapping? Like what what was the, your first time like actually trying to do music? Um, my first time trying to do music, I think I was in a music class and I played um, the clarinet. Me played too. The clarinet. Yeah, it's my primary instrument. Yeah, I played the clarinet and I played um, I played the drums. I used to like the drums a lot too, mm-hmm. and um, just writing a lot. Like I used to write a lot of poetry in school, and like because my dad is um a big poetry writer. Like he likes to write a lot of. He got like stacks of poetry, so I used to just go through his poetry sometime. And in school, most of the time, I'd be writing. That's fire. Yeah. That's dope. Yeah. At, at what point did you start actually taking music seriously, though? Like, do you remember? I think I started taking music seriously in like, um, in like, mm, like probably like fifth, like sixth grade, sixth grade. I started taking it seriously. Um, I started wanting to do like talent shows and stuff like that. Um, because there was a lot of talent shows in Atlanta. And I used to ask my mom, like, beg my mom to put me in time of shows. And she used to go, like, to, like, the hair salons and stuff. And I used to always ask her to bring me there. And I put together, like, these little routines with, like, my group and stuff. I was in, like, a little group with my cousin and my brother. And we'd just be performing for, like, people in the salon. That's dope. And- so talk about the significance before we get into that group. But talk about the significance of, like, local Atlanta talent shows at the time. Because a lot of people were discovered. Uh, mm-hmm. I wish that was still a part of the culture because it was um, good for discovering, like, young talent um, yeah, who eventually blossomed to be a uh, great artist and successful. Right. Um, so, like, yeah, what was that scene? Like, what was the culture? Was it, like, high school? I mean, schools, talent shows, or just, like, community talent shows? Um, I did it all. Like, um, I was in talent shows with, like, Usher, like, this was at the time Usher was trying to come out too, so mm-hmm. I was always in talent shows with Usher a lot, and um, we did everything school talent shows. But this one particular talent show, I was only really in one, like one talent show circuit. Like the people that were doing this contest, it was for uh, um, a record deal with LaFace Records, and um, that's who Usher ended up signing to. Mm-hmm. So 
they did like this series of concerts. Like one was at like a college and like it might have been at a club here. So it was like about three or four contests you had to do before you got to perform at the Civic Center, which is still in Atlanta now. Mm -hmm. So that was like the big finale, the, the, the Civic Center. So we did like three, four shows. Then finally we made it to like the the grand prize, like the last stage, whatever. And then that was for the record deal. And I think the difference between back in the day talent shows and talent shows now is um, I think the people really, whatever they promised the artists, they would really give it to them. Like if you were promised a record deal, you would like really get a record deal. Thanks. But, like, now, it's but like... now it's just, they just promise you anything mm -hmm. to get you to come out. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember having to pay money That's what I was gonna ask to you. perform in a talent show. Like now it's just all about like who's paying to be in a talent yeah. show and whatever. And, so I think that's the difference between back in the day and now. Definitely. I, I was going to ask that. Like, were you having to pay anything up front in order to be involved? Because, like, now it's these open mics, the slides, they're like, yeah. you know, you got to pay X amount in order to just enter it and we'll yeah. maybe promote your stuff. And, yeah. yeah, and I think I think that's the difference. Um, yeah. just, just back in the day, it was just more like if you got talent, if you sign up, and you, out of these 50 people, they would really let the 50 people, out. whoever signed up, they would let you probably audition. And you really had to beat out the best. Like, Usher to this day is the best. Like, right, right. I was up there with the best. Like, I had to beat the best. You know what I mean? We didn't beat them, but I got second place, which told me a lot. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, I feel like now it's not about really who's the best. It's about really who's spending the money and who you know and. You know who's hot on IG right yeah, now. Yeah, let's say what goes yeah. viral, right? Yeah. Um, so let's talk about uh, that group that you're part of. You said you started uh, rapping alongside cousin yeah. and brother. yeah, my, yeah, my cousin, my brother. Shout out to E Dub and um, Bay Boy. Yeah, um, yeah, I started out in a group with my cousin and my brothers. And um, it's was like, this what was it called? Chronic. It was called Chronic. Um, okay. You yeah. got the scoop, huh? Um, it's called Chronic. Um, it's kids rapping on new ideas and concepts. And, um, you know, so we tried to take, I was a real big fan of Dr. Dre and Snoop. So we tried to take, like, the chronic and make it, like, for kids, too. So, Interesting. Yeah, so, so we came up with this concept, kids rapping on new ideas and concepts, K-R-O-N-I-C. Yeah. And um, we called ourselves the chronic, you know what I mean? And um, at the time, it was just kind of like you got... Gas right now. Everybody call we gas. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We wanted to be, we was the we wanted to be the ish of that time. So we was like, okay, we chronic. We ain't smoking yet, but we smoking. <laughs> we on fire. So we chronic, you know what I mean? And um first we was KWA. We was we as kids with attitudes. So when I think about it, I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but I, I was a really big fan of um of West Coast music. Um NWA, Dr. Dre, Snoop, like living in Atlanta. I grew up on, I was on Dr. Dre and Snoop, then I jumped on Outkast, mm -hmm. then I jumped on, because Atlanta, we didn't really have a rap scene then, it was more like a kid scene with Criss Cross and, um, you know, TLC, r &B. it was real R&B, but um, once Outkast hit and the rappers hit, then I started following Atlanta, because that's where I was from, right. but the only people that was doing it I could look up to at that time was like, you know, Snoop, um, Big, Dre, um, Tupac, you know what I mean, so it was yeah. a lot of West Coast rappers. Nice. So you guys got a deal though, right? But y'all yeah. didn't put out any records. No, we actually did. We had um, yeah, we had we performed at this place called Diamonds and Pearls. It was like the old one twelve back mm -hmm. in the day mm -hmm. on Cheshire Bridge, and um, we performed in um, when we performed the labels that were in there. Okay, I gotta bring you back. Okay, so before we got to the Civic Center, we performed um at a spot. RCA was there. <clears throat> but they walked in after we got off stage. Mm. So they missed us. We killed it. They walked in after. And I, when I was leaving, I was seeing the gold bins riding by. And I was like, somebody in that car is somebody. I don't know who it is, but it's somebody. I'm like 11 at the time. So I run back. I knock on the window. I leave my parents. They think I'm still walking with them. I, I done got away, went and knocked on the door. And I'm like, yo, are you such and such? And they like, yeah. And I'm like, I don't want to say his person's name right now, but I was like, are you such and such? He was like, yeah. And I was like, yo, like, you missed our performance, but we killed it. Like, can you take my number and just come check us out? Like, I'm, I'm 10, 11 years old talking like this, right, though. Right. Like, can you take my number? My mom finna whoop my butt, but I, I got to get back, but it'd be worth your time. He actually took my number and he actually pulled up. Nice. You know, like the next day, two days later, he actually pulled up 
And, um, you know, shout out, man, I got to give it up to him. Shout out to K. Wells, man. And, um, you know, when he pulled up from that day, you know, we still were in the talent show. So the final was to go full of face to be at Civic Center. Mm -hmm. So we went and did that. It was a dude by the name of AJ. I stand by this too, dog. AJ, shout out to AJ too. Um, AJ Johnson, I think it was. We, we, you know, we just did that and we performed and you know Usher won and but AJ was his manager too. So I always say we won. But <laughs> but anyway, shout out to Usher, shout out to um, shout out to AJ. But that's what it was, man. Doing talent shows around Atlanta, it was just different because now it's like based off of who you know, how much you spend versus you know raw talent. Yeah, no, I think uh, the talent show, that that era of, like, talent shows and, like, really seeking out talent was important. Yeah. I, like I said, I wish that we could come back around to that that space just so we know that what's being put out there is good. Definitely. Um, neither here nor there. I, so you had the, the group, Chronic, yeah. right? Y'all were a part of the group. I, I want to talk about you being 10, 11 years old and being that, like, eager and hungry and persistent even to just like have a conversation with this grown person at the time so same same you know? way same way i am now man yeah i wanted you to know. know same way i am now just um i was trying to get to the next level man yeah i was trying to get to the next level i think as a kid i just knew what i wanted mm -hmm. i mean i seen other people do it and you know i just knew it could be done right i'm the type of person if you show me one time and i know it could be done then i won't stop until I do that, you know. Yeah, I think that's something that you don't necessarily even learn. It's just already in you, within you. Mm -hmm. Um, especially like for you having parents who you know had a love for music or love for the arts, but weren't necessarily artists. So it's not like you had it like within your family, which is something you wanted to do. So I think that's dope. And also your parents supporting you. Yeah, you know, yeah. taking you to the talent shows and that yeah, speaks to yeah, the family I, having yeah, that I think, support. Yeah, I think having a support system is very um is very important. Just any artist at any time of your career. Once the support system is there, it's easier to to take off. Yeah. But once it's not there, it'll slow down too. You know yeah. What I mean? So facts. always keep your support system like everything. Facts, facts. Yeah. People around you. So look, beyond the group, you eventually went solo. Yeah. Um. What, how did you make that decision? What What was it for you to be like? All right, I'm gonna just do go with Lozane. I mean, it really wasn't a um decision. It was really kind of just like um. We were kids. Mm -hmm. We tried to do something. Um, it didn't work out as fast as everybody wanted it to. Um, some people chose to do other things, and I just knew this is what I wanted to do. I couldn't really see myself doing nothing else. Yeah, you know. So I stuck to it, and it just turned into me being a solo artist. Like I didn't ever want to lead a group. Like I love my brothers, my cousins. It was just more like growing up age and deciding at that point, like, okay, I want to do football. I want to do basketball. Y'all still want to do music, you know? So it kept, it went from me working with three other people. I used to always have to make their ass do it anyway. You know what I mean? Right. They do it. They love it just like as much as I do. But you can always tell from the beginning that that one right there, that's the one that's really, that's really serious about it. Like, yeah. 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 Dope. And, um, let's just, I mean, we can start from a, your record calling me is probably the record that like started or for people who didn't know who you were yeah. um from chronic or from like some of the things you did before right um and your debut album but that record featuring 112 mm -hmm. um it spent five weeks at number one mm -hmm. on billboard a uh, hot rap songs chart and then your debut album young world the future sold about four hundred thousand copies so i was looking at that i mean because at the time when the record was out, I mean, I just knew the song. I didn't really mm -hmm. know anything about the stats and mm -hmm. looking at it this way. But, like, for you being the artist and knowing, like, probably even having the pressure of, of a label mm -hmm. um, or whatever was going on, how did that that situation make you feel? Like, having a really great song, putting out this album, and then not really doing what you want. Maybe even, I don't know, did, were you happy with the success from the album is a better question. I mean, um... At the time, I, at the time, I just was happy just being, doing what I do. Mm -hmm. Like even now, I don't really put like numbers like, on um, it. Numbers on it. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Of course, I want to do numbers. Of course, but I always felt like I was bigger than my records. I always felt like that. Like 
I feel like I was a big, I was an entertainer, not just a rapper. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was an entertainer. Like always, I always felt like I was bigger than my records. Calling me though, that was that was a hit. I mean, that is a hit. Yeah, definitely. So, <laughs> like, did you have any connection to One Twelve? Yeah, on um, One Twelve, we had the same manager, oh, so okay. that's how the whole thing, came the about. whole thing came apart. Um, we had the same manager, and um, they just really nice guys, man. Just yeah. really some people that wasn't no haters, and they just saw a young dude that was dope and talented and eager. Mm-hmm. And they gave me opportunity, so they didn't because they didn't have to do that, but they did that. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I thought that was cool. Yeah, because before you even put out your album, you were touring with them, correct? Yeah, right. I was on tour for probably like three years before my album even came out. Probably the longest time an artist ever been on tour promoting the album. Um, How um, was that experience? It was good and bad. You know what I mean? Um, I think first of all, it was, it was good. It was great. You know, but the bad side of it is just to be on the road for like two years promoting the same single when you got 50,000 songs in the vault. I just didn't get it. But at the time, now now that I look back, at the time, it was just so much going on. Like Lil Zane came out on the Anywhere joint. I did 2 million records. I wasn't signing nobody. Um, then we end up going to get a deal with Priority Records. And in between that deal, I was getting opportunities to go on tour, like with Whitney Houston, mm-hmm. with Bow Wow and... Um, and um, you know, scream tours, different stuff. So it was so much stuff coming at us, and we was getting the money when it came. So it was kind of like, do we go in the album? Do we go in the studio, shut down, and do the album? Or do we keep getting this money that we being presented? So I think that my team just got caught up in, you know, the getting money part, um, like anybody would probably. And then once we realized, yo, the single been out for six months, the album ain't out yet, then we had to buckle down and really just go to L.A. And I think I rented out like a... $30,000 a month mansion, and I put, like, 20 of my guys in there, and we just went to work on the album. Man. Wow. But I think the album came out dope. I think it came out classic. Mm-hmm. Some of my best work to this day. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what I'm working on, Young World of the Future Part 2. That'll be out. This year makes the 20th anniversary of my of my first album. Nice. So I'm putting out Young World of the Future Part 2, and it's going to be really dope. Like, I've been working on it for a couple of years, so it's really, really it's gonna be excited it's exciting. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, wait, so you went on tour with, I mean, Scream yeah. Tour side, Whitney Houston. Yeah. Rest in peace. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. It's like, was that, was it, I mean, I mean, you see that, I've seen that before um, for like a rapper to be on tour with like this R&B artist, but like, was it an odd situation? Did you feel like that was necessary for like your fan base? Um, did it bring? Um, I think it gave me a broader fan base than mm-hmm. other rappers. Mm-hmm. You know, that's where the jealousy comes in and different stuff like that. Like, I think it gives you a broader, a broader. You know, you got this one rapper over here. He might be doing fifty thousand mixtapes a year, and he feel like, damn, I'm only I'm only here. But then you got Lil Zane come around and he do thirty six with Whitney Houston with one song, and boom. So I just think it puts you on that different level. You can go on tour with a bunch of indie artists that's trying to get a name or you can go open up for the biggest of the biggest. And I just felt like that's the, it just gave me an advantage. Um, it wasn't nothing bad about it. It was all good because mm-hmm. I'm performing for 50 year old white people. You know what I'm saying? That really wouldn't know who Lil Zane was if I, if I was doing it on my own. Mm-hmm. But um, I took advantage of it. That little 30 seconds, they let me come out. Boy, I used to think that, that 30 seconds felt like 30 <laughs> hours to me. Boy, I'd be on that jump. And then when it's over and I had to leave, that's when I was mad. I was like, damn. This reality check. This ain't mine. Right. You know what I'm saying? And right. this just made me want to go harder. And, um, you know, you see that many people in the audience. You know what I mean? You just want that. You want that. You know it could happen. Mm-hmm. Like, y'all, I'm in front of these 30,000 people. I'm in front of them. It's like, how can I get here on my own now? Because like, mm-hmm. I'm all about doing things on your own too, not just riding off everybody else. Like, I appreciate the opportunity, but I want to work hard enough one day to have this on my own. Yeah, I think that's everybody, every artist yeah. or creative's uh, goal is to be able to stand on their own two feet yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so at the time when you were touring, at the time when you were preparing to put out your debut album, uh, who were you signed to? Um, when, I was, when I was putting on my debut album, I was signed to Priority Records. You were signed to Priority Records. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, let's talk about like signing deals and like handling the business and, and some things that you may have learned that I don't really know the specifics of like your record deal or, um, 
how it might have been beneficial to you. But I know a lot of artists, especially independent artists, may be seeking label help or just like additional resources. It's a little a lot different in 2020 than it was probably when you were um, seeking out a record deal. But yeah. Even still, an independent artist can only do but so much, right? Yeah. So to those listening, um, what are some things that you learned from securing a deal with priority and to eventually like where you are now um, in, in your own situation? Like, What did you learn early on about the business? Um, I think early in the game, I just learned like um, the, import- the importance of just keeping that circle around you. That's one thing. I feel like no matter what label you sign to or whatever, you always got to have your cool. own team, you know, like going into it. And um, I started out with my own team, but then like, because I wasn't directly signed to like party. I was signed through through a label right. that had a joint deal venture. with them mm-hmm. that had a joint venture. So, you know, um, I came in with my team, you know what I'm saying? Try to, you know, I, I feel like that's how every artist should come in with their own kind of team. And you do business with the labels, you know, um, as far as the difference between then and now, I just feel like the difference between then and now and being signed to labels is I didn't really start hearing like of the 360 deals until like now or whatever. I'm sure they had them back then. They probably just wasn't calling it that or whatever. But, you know, I didn't have a 360 deal. You know, I think that, you know, I didn't I probably didn't have the best deal coming in as an artist, but I, I didn't have the worst deal either. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because I was aware of the fact that, you know, you don't want to give away all your publishing. You don't want to give away all your rights. Like, out, out at a young age, I was hip to that. You know what I mean? So, you know, I feel like I, you know, I tried to negotiate my deal as good as I could being that age. Um, and I feel like, you know, the difference between now, it's better to be independent now because there's different ways to get your music out there where you don't really necessarily need the labels. Um, I would never say, don't say you don't need the labels. Take some means if you can get it and it works for you. But I just feel like as an independent artist now, you have more avenues and more opportunities to create a buzz or create a name for yourself to where them labels will come to you right. and give you what you ask for. Right. You right. know, and um, if I would have knew that now back then, I probably would have never signed a deal. I was two million records sold without a deal. Right, you know? right. Or I could, or I would have asked for more money. You know what I mean? I would have yeah. just did things different. Like so, my my you know my advice to other artists out there is just, you know, why are they interested and why you're hot? Ask for everything you could get for. It. Yeah. Ask for, it. Don't, you know, don't be one of the people that people don't want to deal with you because you're just ridiculous. But like, let me get the goddamn. But if your dreams don't scare you, you're not thinking big enough. Facts. So Facts. ask for what you're worth. Don't ask for what you what they think you were, ask for what you think you were. Absolutely. You know? Great advice. So when you talk about a team, when you talk about coming forth with a team, what was that, or who was that team comprised of? Like, you know, you come roles? in with your manager. Mm-hmm. I think you, sh- you should come in with a manager that, that, that knows your music and that knows you. Somebody that's probably been around you for a while, that's mm-hmm. been through the grind with you. Um, but I know sometimes an artist outgrows that manager and you meet other people, but that manager could still be a part of the, the new situation, if, you know, I've seen situations where you cool with somebody and you grew up with them and they both, y'all look at each other like, yo, this situation is bigger than both of us. Mm-hmm. We're going to go get some help. <clears throat> so I feel like it's that's a good situation just to keep your team around you. Um, I deal with the same lawyer I deal with from day one, John Christmas. You know, I deal with John. John ain't even in the industry, entertainment business no more, but he come back for me. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's just about, you know, being down with people, having people in your circle that, um, you know, from the lawyers to the managers to the, um, you know, even producers. I came in with my own producers from the jump. Even this new album out that I'm about to put out now, it's my own producers. So I always try to come in with my own circle. Right. You know, and um, I feel like if you self-contain, everything else is extra. Mm. Yeah. That's a good word. So, I mean, you talk about, like, I mean, your advice to independent artists um, to because of the avenues that they have right now to m- remain or they can remain independent. But like if a new artist is looking to elevate their career beyond the independent release, like you sold over 2 million uh, records, right? Mm-hmm. But independently. But then for you, it was like, okay, but I want to do more. I need more resources or whatever the case may be um, where you were looking to sign a deal. 
what is your advice to that new artist in this climate? Like, okay, I did this on my own, but now, like, now what? Like, I kind of, I feel, I see that a lot with in, independent artists. Like, they reach, like, a cap almost. It's like, yeah, this is doing this. I have this following, but it's only doing this for this, fo- you know? Um, hmm. My advice would be, you know, in this, speaking for this time right now. Yeah, for 2020. I don't feel like there's no cap on the independent artist. True. I don't think I can agree with that. Um, I think that um, independent artists put their self in the box when they don't reach out. Like, you're independent. You got, you selling 50,000 units over here. Mm -hmm. But if you take some money and go do a song with Bruno Mars or you go do a song with... You know what I'm saying? Somebody that's bigger than what you are, you can get their fan base and still be independent. You know what I mean? Um, Yo Gotti's did it. Young Dolph's did it. You know? Um, it's possible. I just, yeah, I just think it's possible to be independent, remain independent, and still just, you know, if you cool with a, a dude that's on a major and they put millions behind him, you know, go spend some money and get him on the joint. You know what I mean? But sometimes I know it's like, you know, technicalities where you know you gotta have sign offs and stuff like that but you know i just feel like independent artists could you know you could, yeah you gotta have the money of course you gotta have the money um but i think it's more so right now of you touching your fans man you touching your fans you know um youtube is available to everybody facebook is available to everybody ig tiktok triller you know um get on there and go crazy thanks Get on there and go crazy and let them labels come to you and go. You, your favorite artist you think will charge you $100,000. If you get hot enough, he'll do it for free. That's real. You know what I'm saying? He'll do it for free because he, a smart one would. Right. Because he, he's looking for that next thing to attach itself to. Facts. Every big artist has always know if they, especially if they've been down before, like like for me, I've been up there, I've been down, I've been up. So every artist know, big artists know that you got to look for the next thing because you ain't, you aren't, you're not always gonna be super hot, but you can stay hot. You know what I'm saying? You don't have right, to be right. super hot, but you could, you could be super it. hot in 2020, and then you might die down 21, but then 2022, you might find the next big thing, attach yourself to it, boom, you hot again. You know what I mean? So I just feel like if you look, if you stay open to working with other artists, um, doing endorsement deals, you know, linking with other things outside of music will help bring more attention to your situation. Thanks. So let's talk about um, your sound and like some some. Er, you talked early on about your influences being um, just. I mean, as a kid, crisscross and like seeing people who uh, were close in age to you, but then even eventually like the West Coast influence. Um, you got in plenty of comparisons to Tupac. I'm sure you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think pretty warranted just listening to your music. Uh, was that another direct inspiration for you, or do you feel like Cause I, like people literally are like you sound just like this man, you know. Like I a mean, lot of people felt I, like you. I, just, just to, I mean, I think Pac influenced everybody. I right. can still hear Pac's influence in so many artists' music. Mm-hmm. If not his influence, his ways, his thought process, mm-hmm. his his character. You can see it in a lot of these artists out. You know whether they do it on purpose or whether it's, they go home study him and try to be it. I think with me. It was more like, but a lot of them artists they ain't, ain't even even met Pop. You know what I'm saying? They never even met Pop been in the room with him. Like I got songs of the Outlaws. Like when Pop died, I had it's all the Outlaws and me on the song. Like to me, that was like God telling me, like, you know, I met Shug. I walked up to Shug, like, yo, you got a problem with me doing what I'm doing, dog? And he like, man, I ain't worried about your little ass, dog. Keep doing that thing you're doing. That mean to me meant more than people saying, oh, you trying to sound like Pop, like. I met Pac, I been to the crib, had dinner with moms. Like, I was accepted. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I talked to Pac's uncle damn near every day on Face, on, um, on IG. So it's like, at the end of the day, I feel like with that, um, I think I was just inspired, man. Mm-hmm. I, I grew up in a time where I was really young. I'm still mid-30s, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? I'm still mid-30s. Like, I'm, I'm that's considered young, yeah, you, you know, young. in the world. I don't know in the industry they do that now, but... You know, um, you know, I feel like what how old was Kobe when he died? Kobe was 37, 38? 37. Was, I think he was 37. You think he was young? Yeah. Okay. I think he needed okay. definitely. Yeah. So I feel like that. 
You know, no, I feel like that. I feel like thirty-seven. If I was to die right now, niggas would be like, "Damn, he died young." Yeah. But then it's like, now I think he was. Thinking. I think he was like a little, little older or something like that. This is a sportsman right there, Kobe. Like him. No more than forty though. Is that yeah, safe to sure. say? For sure. He wasn't in his forties. He wasn't in his forties. I, th- I thought he was thirty-seven. Cause I was watching the other day, and I'm like, "Damn, he was only thirty-seven. I think he was thirty-seven. Okay, so I feel like you die right now. My darling, I'm like, damn, he was young. Yeah, when, for sure. But when you live and they're like, oh, and you know who. The niggas old, you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like that's crazy, like, when it comes to industry. But just as far as me just coming up, I just felt like, you know, the Pac comparisons, you know, I grew up listening to Pac like everybody else. You know, I met Biggie. I met Pac. You know, Pac was just a little more inspiring to me. You know what I'm saying? I rap for Pac. Pac is like, you know, yo, this dude reminds me me when you growing up. Like, I don't know if he meant that, you know what I'm saying? But me as a kid, rapping for the number one guy in the world, when he'd be like, yo, you remind me me growing up. Like, that inspired me. I think it set off something in my head where I'm like, yo, I just got the stamp from Pac. Like, right. I'm finna go hard with it. You know what I'm saying? Then I met Biggie, and I was in the studio with Biggie all the time. People don't know. Like, I had deals set up where Biggie was supposed to write songs for me and my group back in the day. Like, it just didn't happen because... The label didn't want to pay them. They pay puffing them their money. I think it was like thirty thousand. They wanted for like three songs. I would have gave that up. You know what I mean? Like, but the labels didn't understand how big Biggie was about to be at that time. Because this is ninety two. This ninety three. I had a deal before Biggie. Damn near. I had a deal before Biggie. That's crazy. I remember Biggie coming up as I was having a deal. Mm-hmm. So you know, me being young, I think we was out here opening up for Biggie one day at the Roxy, and um. It's like 93, 94. I'm like, I'm like 10, 11. So I go up to Biggie right before he go on. He's like literally backstage with the mic in his hand about to go on. And I'm like, yo, you need to come do a song with me and my group, man. Like, we should do something together. He looked at me. He's like, I think he hit his blunt. Yo, dog, I don't even heard your music yet, dog. Watch out, <laughs> watch out, little nigga. I'm finna go on stage. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's how he kind of like did it. Like, I ain't even heard your music yet. And this before he knew he was even finna write for us. Like, I think that was even before we had approached them to write for us. Um, this is the beginning of Biggie's day. So right. we got Juicy wasn't even out, I don't right. think. Right. You know, so um, you know, when he like kind of shoved me off, you know what I mean? Like, plus I, I approached him at the wrong time. You know, I approached him right before he's about to go on stage. Literally like backstage, probably last hit of the blunt finna hit the stage. And I'm like, yo, big dog, I wanna do a song. What's up? He like, bro, you see what I'm finna do, man? Watch out, man. <laughs> All right, y'all ready? Listen, like, and went on stage like that. Like, watch out, dog. All right, yo, I'm back, yo. I'm like, this fat motherfucker. <laughs> what the? Like, so I'm looking like that, right? But I love Biggie to this day. Rest in peace. I love you, big. But like, at the time, I'm like, this motherfucker. And then you got Pac when I meet him. And I'm like, yo, Pac, what's something wrong for you, man? He's like, let me hear something, dog. And I'm like, da 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 I remember the rhyme I kicked for him and everything. He like... Y'all still remind me of me and I'm growing up. I'm like, wow. Like, even if he was just gassing me at the time. As it's a young the, nigga, that's what you, that's you what I do to young niggas. Now, I don't gas them, but I give them feedback. Mm-hmm. Like, yo, nah, that's hot, dog. Or, yo, keep working, dog. Or, I didn't really get no feedback from Big. It was yeah, just like, yeah. yo, get out of here, dogs. <laughs> so, Pac gave me that feedback, and I think it went subconsciously. It was like, that's how I want to be when I grow up. When I, be, when I become big rap, I'm gonna stop and let every. I'm gonna stop and listen to every little nigga that come up to me. I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna pay attention, yeah. and that's what I do now. And I also think um, it makes sense. It's very on brand for you to have come from a dad who uh, is literally a poet to you writing your own poetry yeah. to like resonating with someone like Pac. So it it makes sense. I just have to ask a question yeah. because that's obviously something that people hammered like this man you know it's a lot of comparisons and i don't know how artists even feel about comparisons too because it's like you're still a little zane you zane like that's i mean i feel like name. now see this is what i like about the game and this is probably going off the interview but no, this is what fine. i like to say growing up i was able to growing up one of my favorite the reason why i'm a great actor and i say i'm a great actor because i own it because i am a great actor mm-hmm. the reason why i'm a great f- actor as far as an entertaining actor in movies is because I could watch something and I could imitate it. Anything from a voice to I, I listen well, I take good direction. That's what every acting coach ever told me. I can tell you how to do something one time and then you'll go do it. I take good direction. So at one point, rapping in my career, I probably sounded like Snoop. At one point, I sounded like Dre. At one point, I probably sounded like Eminem. I always wanted to be the best of the best. I try to learn, but 
I didn't notice at a young age what I was doing. I was just trying to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. That's what I do now. I know how to do future style. I know how to do little baby style. And if you put me in the studio with all them niggas, I felt like I could do just what they doing or better. You know what I'm saying? Not taking away from them, but just because <clears throat> as an artist, I always was taught by my dad to adapt. Like, listen to what's going on, and that's how you're going to stay around. And that's what Quincy Jones did. Quincy Jones been around since day one because he listened to what's going on. Quincy Jones flew all the way to Paris to learn some shit. You know what I mean? I just watched the documentary because mm -hmm. I'm like, yo, I want to be like somebody. I want to... But like I'm, I don't do beats like Dre. I don't do. I'm not Jermaine Dupri. But I can write and I can orchestrate and I can arrange. Who did that? I'm like, man, Quincy, Quincy did that. Yeah. He know how to play the instruments a little bit, but you ain't never seen him pick up. You know what I mean? You ain't really see him in the in the doing that. He be, ah, oh, you. That's me. <laughs> that's me. You yeah. know what I mean? So I had to figure out what it was. And mm -hmm. I and and growing up, I figured like. I knew how to do everybody's style and imitate whatever. I don't really call it imitate. I really I, I call it learn. Mm -hmm. Learning there, you like you learn different languages: mm -hmm. English, Spanish. How many languages you know, Kurt? About three. Okay. <laughs> Some people, most people you know, went to school. They know two, three, four languages. I feel like when you learn different styles as an artist, that's like learning a language to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna learn how to rap fast. I know how to rap slow. I know how to do the Cali swag. I know how to come over here and do some reggae if I got to. I know how to. So I feel like as an artist, you gotta know different languages because right. I, I want to talk to different fans. Right. Absolutely. So I learned Pac style, learned Biggie style, learned Snoop style, learned just like now. When you hear my music now, I can't wait till y'all hear the music because I be I be excited like. What they gonna say now? Cause I switched my whole swag up. I don't sound like pop. I don't sound like nothing you heard before. But I went, but that's why I've been gone for so long. Cause mm -hmm. I when you in school and you learn a new language, you gotta go away for three, four years and learn that language and come back fluent. Right. You ain't just gonna start getting to class and then the next day be like, yo, this is what I got, a little better of the Nah, you gonna shut up for a minute until you learn your new swag. Then you're going to pop out. And so I feel like I put myself in music class. Like all these years, people haven't really seen me out there because I've been trying to find that new flow. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to find that, you know, staying in the gym, staying, uh, staying relevant with what's going on. Like, you know, listening to all the hottest new. Like you ask me my influences now. It ain't none of them niggas I just named. My influences now is me. You know what I'm saying? The 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 Jay Z's, the Kanye's, the little TJ's, the little babies, the futures, you know, the 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 Bruno Marses, the the um who else is just big? Um, you know, anybody big. I study the biggest of the biggest. Uh, like why are they uh, why are they big? Kobe mm -hmm. studied Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. So you can't be mad when Kobe make that fade away. Oh, he looked like Mike. You mad at that man because he look he studied Mike. So I feel like people don't look at it the rap like that. Like, okay. He sounded like Pac a little bit because that's who was the best at that time. You know what I'm saying? If you come out now trying to sound like, you know, my thing is this. Where I'm at right now is like, yo, is niggas going to accept this new wave? Because it's so funny how people are. Like, people say, oh, you sound one way. And then you do something else. You man. sell a million records doing it. Mm -hmm. And then they want to say, okay, well, he sound like this. So then you go switch your whole style. And then you like, now you don't even. Now they're like, yo, what happened when you used to sound like that? I want you to go back to how you used to sound. That's how I was getting that a lot. So then I was like, you know what? I'm finna stop doing music for like three, four, five months. I'm just finna listen to everything going on, and I'm gonna take my spin and put off to it. And that's why that's what I did. I did that about 2015. Mm -hmm. I started doing that. 2000, yeah, about 2015, 14. I started saying, you know, because I went to Cali for a minute, and Cali music is different from Atlanta music, so. I had realized, like, yo, I lost the air for a minute. Still not to make a hit, but I just, what do they want right now? Mm -hmm. Where's the world at right now? What's mm -hmm. going on in the world, my nigga? What's, what's niggas doing right now? Yeah, you being that's the only, be lost. That's the only way you're going to be the next one, to mm -hmm. know what's going on right now and what's the sound. Mm -hmm. And I went, and I went and studied that. And anybody that's, the people that's in the industry that need to know, and the people that's going to know, they know I'm on some old, I'm on a whole nother wave right now. Like, I, I can't explain it. You just got to get in the studio with me. You got to put Chris Brown in the studio with me. You got to put your favorite rapper in the studio with me. And then be like, okay, let's see what come out. And they're going to be like, yo, like some of the people you love right now is on top of the charts. They listen to some shit I wrote for them right now. They learning it. 
And all that matters to me is they know I'm dope. Yeah. And I you'll never hear them people say, yo, Z is whack. Because you can't call niggas some whack that, that's writing with you on some stuff. So, and I'm just true to the game. I understand how artists start like... Artists don't want, even when I when I came up in the game at first, I wrote all the time, but I had writers that used to help me. Of course. Because I never knew how to write hooks. Mm. I never knew how to write hooks. So if you get my whole first album, you hear a bunch of singing niggas on the hooks. Like, yeah, yeah. 112, calling me, calling mm. me. Like, you probably hit me on, like, two hooks on my first album because my first, because I, I couldn't write hooks. Now I'm the hook king. Now I outwrite any nigga walk in here talking about he got a hook. Like, and I come up with it fast. And I'm cocky when it comes to that because I went to school. I studied the game. Mm-hmm. I probably couldn't do this three years ago and sit here like this with you. But I'm like, I got it now, dog. Yeah, yeah, I got yeah. it. Because I know I studied. Like, when you studied and you know you prepared, mm-hmm. you can do that. It's like when you, when you, it's like, to me, it's like a, a test at school. You got the people that come in and they ain't study. They're like, damn, dog, how you think you're going to do? And you got that one nerd that's in the corner like, I'm good, buddy. You, you good? <laughs> Like, I'm the nerd in the corner. Like, I'm good, buddy. Like, because I studied this. Yeah. In school, I sat in the front. I was probably the baddest kid in the class, but I sat in the front like this. My work was done first. Just looking at me. And I didn't notice that until I got older. I used to sit in the front and have the work done and be bored. That's why I got in trouble because I was bored. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? I got mm-hmm. bored with music for a minute. Because I had did it so much mm-hmm. at a, such a young age. I got bored with it. Mm-hmm. I had to find another reason to be happy with it again. I feel you. And I think sometimes you could find going to prove yourself. Like, that's why you always want to be able to not really prove yourself, but challenge yourself. Mm-hmm. I think what keep me going is the fact that I'm challenging myself. It's not. And I love proving people wrong. Mm-hmm. I love proving people wrong. If everybody's like, go, go, go. It's like, who's against me? All right. You, what, what, what you think I can't do? That's me. Like, I don't like D riders. You know what I'm saying? I'm cursing him, but I don't, I don't like yes men. I don't that's like that. Open. Everybody walk in the room. That's hot. Oh, that's hot. I understand sometimes it's hot. But is it one person in here that got, that can say, has an how can we make this shit better? Mm-hmm. Everybody just content. I never been content, man. You've always been very vocal and very opinionated, very cocky, um, which I think is just a, a trait that many artists should have anyway. You should believe in yourself the most, um, especially if you want to be successful, because you got to believe before you can convince other people, right? Uh, but we we all privy to, to you um, and your issues with Young Buck. Um, what issues? Okay, maybe no issues currently, but at the time, there was a, a pretty open disc on the radio that I cannot not speak about. I mean, I look, uh, at, I look at it like this, man. Shout out to Young Buck all them. I be on Young Buck's page. I be shy. I be, uh, once the nigga get to know me, it's like, bro, at the end of the day, how you diss a god, bro? Like, how you diss a nigga that be in the game that every nigga in the industry that he probably love, love me? You know what I'm saying? Like, I got a great face in the industry because I always been that little dude in the studio. I grew up with the two shorts, the Kurtz. You know what I'm saying? Like, the people that matter to me, as long as they love me and they not dissing me, I care nothing less about anybody else. You know what I'm saying? I feel like niggas say my name because it's a cool thing to say. You say my name because it's a cool thing to say. You know what I mean? Like, it's not cool to say Pee Wee Herman right now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not cool to say. I feel like you got to stop taking things so personal. I think one thing about me, I never take I never take anything personal. But I mean, there's a certain level of like, just in rap in general, not just talking about Young Buck, but like the, the this record to the game and even to, I thought that that was interesting. I, 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 at that point, I was just, <laughs> got. I got, I get, sometimes you get tired niggas picking on you. And, but where'd Tyler come from? Because he was picking on me. I don't remember this. He was picking on me. Mm-hmm. He started that. He started it. So you were just like, I was new to the it. social media stuff, and I kept hit seeing some dude saying, where's Lil Zane? Where's Lil Zane? I'm looking for Lil Zane. Where's Lil Zane? Where's Lil Zane? So I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just jumping on Twitter. I'm like really not a social media dude. Like I'm, yeah. I'm the person to see you and smack you in your face. I'm not going back and forth on, on the Twitter. On the internet. Right? You know what I'm saying? Like, But also, I'm the dude that's cool. Like I'm like, I ain't even on that. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Unless we got to go there, I don't even be on that. Like, yeah. I'm like the fun guy. I'm the guy that you want to hang out, go get some, go get some girls with or something. I'm not, I'm not really that guy. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
So I'll be understanding, like, why are they coming at me? It, it only could be one reason, nigga, because I'm doing something that y'all niggas want to do or you envy when I was doing or it was just a cool thing to do. I don't mm -hmm. know, but I don't take anything personal. But as far as with, you know, um, the, the, as far as with the Young Buck situation, I think that, you know, he it, what, what what year was it when they came out? 2003, 2004, five, you know, G-Unit came out. <clears throat> Lil Zane was still moving. Lil Zane was still moving. You know what I'm saying? I disappeared for a minute. Them niggas probably miss me. You know what I'm saying? Make rap niggas disappear like Lil Zane. I heard it. I thought it was funny. But then I'd be like, okay, where Buck at right now? Where's Buck at right now? So I learned from that experience, never kick a man while he down, dog. I feel like niggas was kicking me while I was down. Instead of trying to come help me and do a record with me, niggas kicking me while I was down. But I never was really vocal about it because, for one, it's like I got other shit going on. Mm -hmm. For two, I'm like, these niggas ain't got hearts like me. Like, I could take a joke. I could take you saying, yo, this nigga disappeared, and I can brush it off and go get some money. But when I say this shit I'm going to say about y'all niggas, y'all niggas going to want to fight. You niggas going to want to stab me. You're going to kill me because you don't have, you're not built like I'm built. Mm -hmm. I got tough skin, dog. I come from. Biggie Pac, I come from that era. You know what I'm saying? I, I think it's important that we discuss or just talk about the ebbs and flows of, or like, you yeah. know, just having your highs, having your lows, and knowing how to recover. I think um, that's an important conversation that yeah. you can shed some light on. Like, you know, yeah, you may have disappeared or gone away for a couple of years, but like, you continue to stay motivated and do that. Stay this. motivated. Stay in the gym. Not to cut you off, but stay yeah. in the gym. Um, You know, stay, you know, I... Just because I don't put a thousand songs out a day, I'm doing a, I'm doing damn five, six songs a day, man. Like, when you hear my new stuff, it's like, okay. If you ain't going to say nothing, you're going to be like, yo, that nigga still got it, and he damn near sound better than the rest of these niggas that sound now. Because it's like, I understand the importance of staying relevant. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And um, just to visit that situation again... With the Tyler, with the Tyler situation, I love. First of all, I love all them artists from Buck to Tyler to the Game. It's nothing but love from Lil Zane. For one, because I'm good, nigga. Regardless of rap or not, nigga, I'm good. So it's not. I'm not tripping on that. What I'm. What I want to say is the Tyler creative shit was. I felt like niggas was picking on me. I didn't know about the Twitter stuff. I responded like, "Yo." What's Gucci, bro? Like, I heard you looking for me. What's up? And then he, then he was like, oh, I got him. Oh, and that's how it trouble. was. I didn't know. What, that's when I learned about trolling. I was like, okay, this nigga's just a clown. He's just a troll. Oh, like, this nigga's just a clown. <laughs> so then I'm like, so then, then around the same time, Game has said something about, like, in an interview about, you know, whack rappers, whatever. And I'm like, this is, my, this is supposed to be my man. Like, when I was coming up, I was with Game a lot. Right. Like, his managers, d Mac and them, shout out to d Mac and them. They was my guys. They was the same guys that brought me out. So, I was like, yo, I couldn't understand where it's coming from. But then, once I understood Game, I'm like, oh, this nigga right here, this nigga be trolling. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's my man. He be trolling. Like, But I felt like I knew it wasn't nothing personal, me and Game, because I knew we was cool before. So, I was like, you know what? Maybe dude trying to throw me a line. Maybe dude... Maybe he want me to say something so we can keep this shit going. So I said, yo. So I went in there and I did my little Niggas in Paris remix. And I threw it out. I didn't think nobody's going to pick it up. At this time, like, anybody think about me. Then Worldstar picked it up. Boom, next day. Like, two hours later, I'm like, oh, shit. Did 50,000, 100,000. I'm like, yo, this shit going up in numbers. And then my boy never responded. <laughs> <laughs> he never responded. So I was like, two things happened. It, he felt like... That nigga ain't big enough to respond to. I don't know. Three things. Or he like, yo, this nigga actually got some flow. This nigga might fuck around and say some shit, right? Because I wanted to go way worse on the nigga. But I was like, you know what? I ain't going to go that worse on the nigga. Even though nigga tried to kill me and Savage, I ain't going to go that worse because I got to have a sec. I got to have a comeback. If them right. niggas come back with something, I got to come back with something crazy. Right. So... You know, to me, I just took it as a sport. I never got, I never, I never felt like when I see these niggas, it's a problem. Right, right. I never felt like that. Because I know I'm the type of nigga, like, yo, what's up? What was it about? What was that about? I got one coming back at your ass, dog. Get ready. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm like, I'm like that. I'm that's like that. You know what I'm saying? You're going to have to really just walk up and smack me for me to know it's really a problem. Really like, sure. you know what I'm saying? Because I'm like, I don't take this shit serious. It's like, hey, bro, I heard what you said. I don't know why you said it, but I got something coming at you. If I feel like you big enough to go at, I felt like, 
you know, I just did Tyler and Game in one song because I wanted to get out the way. Yeah, I'm like, I, I, now that I'm I never even responded it. to Buck. Yeah, it might not. Have I think been. in an interview, I might talk some shit. I might be like, yeah, I'm better than that nigga, man. 50 should sign me. You know what I'm saying? I said shit like that just because that's being an artist. That's being that's being competitive. You know what I mean? Yeah. Tr nigga trying to, you know, this how I eat, man. So it's like, at the end of the day, when nigga say something like, oh, disappear, la boom, boom. I know I ain't disappeared, but at the same time, you over here messing with my legacy, dog. So I'm going to get at you somewhere in the interview or something. But at the end of the day, we see each other. It's like, what's up, my dude? It's good. Like, you want to do a record, dog? You want to prove to the world I'm better than you? Or you want to keep this shit going like that? I'm more like that. You know what I'm saying? I'm cocky with it like that. I'm cocky more on the, like, say what you want to, but, nigga, you don't want to step in this booth, nigga. You don't want to. You don't want to really look at the stats, nigga, because the stats is crazy. Like, I don't even care about music to the point. Like, when you look at the movie stats, it's like, none of y'all niggas ain't did no movies with Eddie Murphy. You ain't did no movies with Sean Connery. You ain't did no movies with Beyonce, nigga, Cuba Gooding Jr., nigga. Right, like, right. it's a lot. You know what I'm saying? Fighting Temptations is one of my favorite movies. Mine, I really too. Enjoyed it. Mine, too. I really enjoyed <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I feel like um, out of all the church movies, that was one of the best ones. Not just because of a minute. You no, got Sister, great. you got Sister Act. I feel like that was one of the best church movies. Yeah. Like, you can't, undeniable, you yeah, know what I mean? So, sure. I look at it like that, like, on a bigger scale. Like, you know, what Kurt looked like arguing with anyway. Tree Sound yeah. when he's patchwork. It's like, bro, I've been here for years. I ain't going nowhere. Yeah. You know, we might throw little shots on the IG. Hey, come over, come over here to Patchwork and not Tree Sounds. They ain't even got Pro Tools. You know what I'm saying? Like, you might say something like that, but he, Kurt ain't finna go all out his way to, cause he mm -hmm. know he know what he doing. And I think I was just raised like that. Like, and again, shout out to all those guys too. Whether you said my name, whether you didn't say my name, whether you showed love, you know, with me, we just in a situation where they always trying to pin us against each other. Mm -hmm. They want me to get in the interview and say, "Yo, f young buck." F That's not me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I can say it now, and then when I see him, I'll be like, yo, my bad I say that, dog. Cause not because I'm scared, because I don't really feel like that in my heart. And I had yeah. dudes that they've been like, F Lil Zane, and I didn't did stuff for 15 years for, and I can't even say the same thing because that's not what's in my heart. You know what I mean? My, I, my mom always taught me, like, you ain't got nothing good to say, don't say nothing. Right, facts. You know what I mean? No, I think um, all of those things are valid. I yeah. had to just ask because I think even just, you know, talking about some of the people that you grew up around, like the Bigs, the Pox, like the controversy in music, that's been a thing. It's not new. Um, and it's kind of creates the entertainment. And I done seen niggas die over this shit. Right. So it's like, at the end of the day, bro, it's like at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's like this shit like a job to me. You know what I'm saying? If you going to work at you this your podcast, right? Mm -hmm. If you finna die over this shit, nah. You know what I'm saying? Like nah. at the end of the day, it's like I'm seeing I came from an era I saw niggas really die over this shit. Right. So it's like I don't never let the music get to the point. Something I love and have fun doing get me to the point to where I'm angry. Right. Like when that shit happened, it'll be off camera. It won't be no on camera. It'll be whatever consequences come with it, they come with it. Because I ain't no punk. I ain't scared of nothing. Nobody on earth. But my thing is, I think before I do stuff, I know them F, them, them, them alphabet boys be watching. So if I say, yo, I'm going to smack this uh, such and such when I see him. Like, now they know. That now they know that's what you plan to do. Right. So it's like at the end of the day, you know, don't let certain, to my advice to other artists, is like, if you really about your bag and you, and you really confident in what you're doing, you know, don't let don't let don't let negativity get to you. At the end of the day, you know, say what you gotta say, keep it moving, but don't let something you have fun doing turn to something you feel like it's a chore time. You know what I'm saying? It turned to something you feel like you're gonna have to die over tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You Great know what advice. I mean? Great advice. So I mean you said new music. New music. This year. New music this year. Um and actually February. I got a I got an interview with B T dropping February fourteenth. That's on Valentine's Day. Oh sweet. Um, it's called Finding BET. Only reason why I did the Finding BET because a, a lot of people was against me doing it. Um, I only did the Finding BET because I felt like I have a different story. I know you've seen other people on it, but I felt like those people never really gave you a glimpse of what they're doing now or what the plans were now. Yeah, it was just like, yo, such and such, he did this, he did this, he did this, and now he's here, and then it goes off. Mm -hmm. On BET, I made them promise no. You gotta see. You gotta. Where are we going? You gotta follow me around the hood. You gotta 
We finna hop in this drop top. You finna follow me around the hood. You finna see how I really live. Because a lot of these dudes that's on here, I feel like they be capping. You know, and I feel like you got to feel like the love the streets got for me. Well, this this how much love I got, and I and I haven't put a record out in a while. Mm -hmm. And I want them to follow me around. I want I didn't want to just be in a building. They were just in the living room. I was like, let's get if I'm gonna do this, let's get outside of here. And you got to take and you got to come to Patchwork. Shout out to Kurt. Mm -hmm. And you got to come to Patchwork. And you got to get me in the studio doing my new stuff. You gotta you gotta premiere some of my new stuff because everybody yeah. else. I didn't hear no new songs. It mm -hmm. was just like what they did, old stuff, what happened, boom, boom, then they went away. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, my story really still being written. Right. I didn't really feel like I deserved to be on there at first because I'm like, my story's still being written. Like, I'm not over with. But if y'all want me to do it, I could use the exposure and I'm going to take it for what it is for me. I'm going to take this this to platform and promote what I got going. I'm mm -hmm. going to promote my homie that got the studio. I'm going to promote my new music that I'm in my homie studio doing. So I try to put everything together. You know, That's I'm going to bring y'all to the barbershop where I grew up at. I'm going to bring y'all, you know, to the hood where I grew up at, to the house that I first bought my mom when I got my bread. You know what I mean? Show you that I can still come around here. I'm by myself. It's no security. I got all my jewelry on. Like, that said something. Mm-hmm. And then even to BET, when they call me now, they be like, yo, out of all these people we interviewed, we're very excited about your interview. That's what's up. Because it was real, it was authentic, and you know, I wasn't I wasn't trying to I wasn't trying to put on a show. It was yeah. more like I just happened to be in patchwork, y'all can come near. I didn't book patchwork for that day and we had already been working. You know what I mean? So it was like this is what I'm doing now. I just want y'all to capture this moment of what I'm doing. I'm in the studio, I'm I'm in the streets, I'm here. You know, and I think that it worked out. And I, I really can't, I really can't wait to, can't wait to say. I think they asked me about the same question you asked about the Buck stuff. And I gave the same, one thing about me, I'm going to get the same answer every time, bro. People give you the same, different answers. Like, I give you the same answer because it's not rehearsed. It's like, this is what it is. Like, mm -hmm. Zane, is she pretty? Yeah, she pretty. She bad. I ain't going to tell you the next person, be like, nah, she ugly, dog. Like, I'm going to say the same thing every time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um... I know we got to kind of wrap it up, but I know that you're a father, mm -hmm. um, a daughter, and a son. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I didn't want to misquote, but um, your son pursuing music? Um, You know what? I think my son is more into video games right okay. now. My son wants to be a YouTuber. He wants to be a comedy. He wants to be a game reviewer. Nice. So I bought him all the camera and stuff. He got it set up, and nice. he's more into playing video games and telling you about them. And you know, he's but he's and my daughter's more of the singer. Singer, okay. My daughter's already in the studio. Nice. She's already working. How old is she? She's nine. She's about to be nine. She's eight. Nice. So um, you know, she's more the one that's on the music. My 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 son is more the video guy, the video game guy playing the background, gotcha. sports. Yeah. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. That's cool. That's dope. I um. I always kind of ask, like, you know, the balance of, or you have younger children, but balance of, yeah. you know, still doing music. And and like you say, you're young. So, yeah, like, you, yeah. I think people don't understand that you started when you were, like, I just started young. Old. You know, I mean, that's a gift yeah. and a curse. When yeah. you start young, then they just like, oh, he got to be about 50, 60. Nah, I'm still mid-30s, you know. You know, honestly, I feel, you know what I'm saying, I feel... You know, I feel I feel you, fool. Just because I'm in, I'm, you know, I I run five miles a day. You know what I'm saying? Like I run five miles a day. I'm I'm around 18, 19 year old dudes all day trying to try me, and I gotta <laughs> put them up real quick. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, um, Kirk can relate, man. When you when you stay on point, you ain't gotta get ready. And um, you know, but I know in this industry, you know, especially with urban music, you know, they try to put, you know, limits on you. Yeah. You know, after 30, the black artist is. But then we still celebrate Paul McCarthy. And we still celebrate women. Paul McCarthy walk in here right now. We're going to be like, Paul, what's up? Man? Let's do a record real quick. I feel like we 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 so against our own kind. It's crazy to mm. me. Mm. Mm. It's crazy to me. You know what I'm saying? So what I'm trying to do right now is I'm trying to just bridge that gap. I feel like. A lot of older artists used to beat the young artists down so much for not being the way they wanted them to be. Or how, 
that they turn the young artists against them. Mm-hmm. You know, like, well, forget you then, old nigga. You don't know what you're talking about. We don't know what we're talking about. We'll just do it on our own. Mm-hmm. I don't never tell an artist that what they're doing isn't going to work. Mm-hmm. I'm like, dog, everybody got their own way of coming in the game. Everybody got their own special way of what works for them. Mm-hmm. Just do what works for you, bro. Do what works for you. Keep keep up the good work. Keep, and that make me different and makes me have a different mind with the younger artists coming up. Because they like, for one, when they get around me, they're like, yo, sneaky. I look younger than they ass, you know what I'm saying? Like, but then it's it's all about, it's not about the age, it's about the respect. It's about the respect. At the end of the day, age don't matter. What type of music you don't matter. Cause a rap artist to do a song with a country artist. We've seen it with Nas and with mm-hmm. it's just about the respect. You know, Nas respected him. He respected Nas. They did a record together. Mm-hmm. Boom. I think it's, it's all star respect Absolutely. from artists. You know what I mean? My last question is who had the best verse on Hardball? Me, for sure. <laughs> For sure, I definitely. That one came from Twitter. Oh, um, definitely had the ver- best <laughs> verse on Hardball. Um, Wayne, I mean, Bow Wow didn't write his shit. <laughs> I couldn't understand what the fuck Wayne was saying. And I love I loved Wayne at the time. And then, goddamn, and, and me, I went in that motherfucker. I was the first nigga that recorded the song. Okay. I was the first nigga to drop his verse. It was just a beat. I didn't even hear the fucking chorus or nothing. <laughs> So if y'all niggas heard my shit that couldn't go in there and make it better, after listening to mine, <laughs> and, that, and that's part of being an artist. We all going to talk shit. Bow going to say his shit was the best. Wayne going to say his shit was the best. I'll be, I will be right surprised. Now. I'll be surprised if if they didn't say it. You know what I'm saying? Like, again, ain't no disrespect. I love all them brothers. I love all them to death. But I had the motherfucking best verse, nigga. <laughs> That's what it is. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to all my dogs, though, man. But that's one thing I wanted to see happen, too. I thought that that album should have happened. Bow, Lil Wayne, Lil Zane, Sammy. I think that would have been a dope album, a dope tour. And, um... I still think, you know, down Anything with all this possible. with all this millennial shit going on, I think still think, possible. but I don't live in the past. I'm past that. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Uh, again, man, I haven't spoke to Bow Wow Wayne in them in years. You know, I think I talked to Sammy recently. But um, you know, shout out to all them guys, man. Just just I like to have on record, you know, shout out to all them, man. I love all them dudes because that's part of my that's part of my my history. That's part of my, you know, that's what made me sit back and smile. Like, yeah, we did that. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? But we all come from that cocky shit. Nigga, I had the best verse, nigga. <laughs> what you talk about, boy? <laughs> I had to ask that. I had to ask that. Well, I've, I've taken up more than uh, your 15 minutes, oh, yeah. it looks like. Yeah. And um, I appreciate you for sitting down with me. You can... Of course, tell the people where they can find you on social media. Okay, how y'all doing, man? My name is Lil Zane, a.k.a. Zane Copeland Jr. And you can find me at Lil Zane's World on Twitter, on IG. That's L-I-L-Z-A-N-E. Let me say it again. L-I-L-Z-A-N-E-S-W-O-R-L-D. Spelled out Lil Zane's World. Facebook, Twitter, all that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. And as always, thank y'all for tuning in. Um, This is the I Do Music Podcast. You can find us on social media at IDM Podcast, as well as myself at Sammy Approved on all social media platforms. Thank you. Peace. And thank you for having me, too. No problem. Appreciate it. Sonic Superior.